is not going to produce fruit if it's not connected to the vine. And he says, but if you'll connect your life to mine, I'm talking about a different kind of life. I'm talking about giving you a life with eternal purpose. I'm talking about you experiencing purpose in your life like you never thought you could and getting to leave the legacy after you're gone that you dream of leaving. We are in week seven of a teaching series called I Am. Some of you are like, is it ever going to end? It is. This is the seventh and final week of the I Am series. And hey, um, thank you for the three of you that enjoyed it. Um, no, no, too late. Um, if you've missed it, man, I really highly encourage you to go back, get caught up. Um, and, and I don't say this jokingly, especially Doug and James' messages. Guys, we are so blessed to have these men preaching into our lives. And so I just, I love you both, and I'm so grateful for you guys. And I'll still make fun of both of you publicly. Um, so, so we're in week seven, and I love this series because if you're just joining us, what we've been doing is, and the reason we get so excited about this one is, Jesus seven times in the book of John says, I am, and then he describes himself. And the reason that's so important is because he also says, if you get to know me, you'll get to know the Father. He's trying to help us get to know him so that we can get to know God the Father, because we're not playing religious games. We're not here to do religious activities. Jesus is trying to help us know we can have an authentic relationship with the creator of the universe. Like, that's what we're doing. And so this is absolutely essential that we pick up on what Jesus is trying to help us understand. He wants, he says, you get to know me, you get to know the Father. The more you get to know the Father, you'll understand how he can change your life how you can have a meaningful relationship with him, how it'll give you a brand new purpose in the here and now and eternal life. And that's, that's what we get so excited about. So I'm glad you guys are here. Welcome to Red Rocks Church. I was wondering if you're gonna make any noise. About 20, I was about 22 years old, right out of college, obviously best college in the country, Kansas University. Rock Chalk Jayhawk Goat. KU is what you would have said. <clears throat> it's fine. We'll, we'll, we'll work on it. Um, I'm living out in LA, I'm trying to work in the film business. Um, I didn't really wanna be an actor, I just wanted to be rich and I didn't wanna get a job after I graduated and that sounded like a better option. So I drove to LA and uh, to my surprise, nobody met me at the city limits with like any sort of job offers, really weird. And so I started working behind the scenes to, to try to pay rent. And so my, one of my very first jobs, it was almost like a, like a perfect storm of like a dream come true because I was trying to like get behind the scenes in movie sets and TV sets, and I got to do that, and I love sports, and so I'm working behind the scenes on this show that plays every Sunday on Fox before all the football games. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. And so, until I tell you my job responsibilities, and then you'll be very unimpressed. Um, I was a PA, I was the low, low man on the totem pole, okay? A production assistant, basically I do what everybody else doesn't want to do. And so one of my jobs was, is um, two of the guys on the, on the crew, and they're still on it today, and somehow they look exactly the, as the same, just as good as they did 20 some years ago. It's, it's Howie Long and Terry Bradshaw. And so I would sit in Howie Long's chair, and they would set the lights, because he's not gonna waste time. So I sit there, like, who, we just get some idiot to sit in the chair so we can set the lights, and I'm <laughs> here to serve. And so I'd get there, and they'd set the lights. And then another one of my really important jobs was Howie Long, um, apparently, I think it was because he had a little bit of a dry mouth, which I'm like, got you? And so um, I drink water for mine, so, but he would chew gum in between every take. And it had to be bazooka bubble gum. <laughs> One of my jobs was to fill a cup on his right-hand side with bazooka bubble gum. And then in between every take, he would spit out a piece and put it in here. My job was to also deal with that cup. Now, the funny thing is, I was thinking about it this week. I'm texting my friends back in Kansas, and I'm like, guys, I'm in Hollywood. I'm living the dream. I didn't tell him I was just emptying his chewed up bubble gum most days. So, so I'm doing that, and then and I hear them having this conversation. In fact, everyone on set hears them having this conversation because they're mic'd up. But how he says to, to Terry, he says, man, nice watch. And he's like, ah. He goes, it's too shiny. How he's like, what? He goes, no, no, it's too shiny. I need to like throw it around, kick it around or something. He's like, it's too shiny. It's a Rolex. It's supposed to be shiny. I don't like it. It's too shiny. And I'm thinking, I just moved to LA. I can't pay my rent this month. Your Rolex is too shiny. Like, we all got problems. You know what I mean? We all got problems. How he says to Terry, he says, um, bro, you know that movie I was just filming? He's like, the funniest thing. We're out in the middle of the desert. 
me and John Travolta in a Humvee. We're about to shoot the set, the, the next scene, and John Travolta says, you wanna have some fun? Howie goes, of course I do. He goes, John Travolta grabs the walkie-talkie and he goes, uh, we're not gonna be able to shoot another scene until we get some homemade cookies brought to the Humvee. And then he puts it down and they just start laughing. And the producer, I guess, starts freaking out because time is money and everything's rented by the hour and all the workers are union and it's all by the hour. And so the producer's kind of freaking out and uh, goes, you know, <laughs> that's, that's funny, guys, but we gotta get this shot filmed. Sun's going down and, and apparently John Travolta goes, um, I understand and we would love to film that as soon as we get those cookies. <laughs> and Howie Long's kind of like in awe and he goes, you're not gonna believe what happened. He goes, it was like 10 minutes later, and here comes this helicopter out to the middle of the desert, brings us chocolate chip cookies inside the Humvee. We ate the cookies before we filmed the next shot. Isn't that crazy? And I'm walking away, and I'm like, that's not crazy. That's amazing. I'm thinking, that's why I moved here. Like, that's the life I want. I want to be that rich. I want to be that successful. I want to have that kind of power. I want to be able to summon chocolate chip cookies to my Humvee via helicopter, not deal with his chewed up bubble gum. Like, they had no, nothing they were doing. They're just talking, having fun. But see, what well, I took that conversation and turned it into a life goal. I, I want a life like that because that's what, that's what greatness is, and that's what I'm looking for. Today, we're going to look at what Jesus talks about what it looks like to have a great life, and we're gonna see if the two line up. Sound like a good deal? <laughs> Title of today's message is I Am the Vine, Helicopters, Humvees, and Chocolate Chip Cookies. <laughs> if you have a Bible, turn to John 15. This is the seventh I Am statement. Jesus says, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, Unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Here it is. I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Probably theologians believe they're, they're, they're just finishing the Last Supper and they're walking down to the Garden of Gethsemane and, and they're passing some some vines, some grape vines, and it's a perfect illustration for Jesus. And he says, guys, it's, this is how your life works. Take one of those branches and rip it off that vine, and you know what happens. It just lays there and dies. That, that branch will never again produce anything meaningful. But as long as that branch stays connected to the source, it can produce all kinds of beautiful things. And that's, that's kind of how life works, guys. You need to stay connected with me. That word abide, it's remain, it's consistent, it's stay. You need to stay in me. I am the vine, you are the branch. And if you'll keep your life connected with me, you'll produce all kinds of things. Now, I have one friend who owns a vineyard in Napa Valley, and he cares very much about grapevines. Other than him, I know nobody who cares a lot about grapevines or grapes. And so if we're not careful, we read this passage and we go, oh, abide in me and I in you and I'm the vine and you're the branches and you'll bear fruit. And we go, great, what's next? That's what I did. And so I'm reading it, reading it, reading it. I'm trying to go, okay, what, what's so important about this I am statement? Because Jesus doesn't do coincidence. He doesn't do accident. He had something very intentional. He was saying, what did the original listeners understand that we need to understand? because we don't have the appreciation of a grapevine that they apparently did, and we wouldn't have understood the words that Jesus was saying in the way that they would have. So I started rereading it, rereading it, rereading it, looking at all these words in the Greek and going, what, what am I missing? And then all of a sudden, I got it. See, the promise is, what's the promise? He says, if you abide in me, you'll bear much fruit. Now again, okay, right? I mean, until I read what that word is in the Greek. And this, this all of a sudden started to sort of let the whole thing unfold. That word fruit in the Greek is karpos, properly fruit. Figuratively, the way Jesus was using it, everything done in true partnership with Christ. For example, a believer, a branch, lives in union with Christ, the vine. By definition, fruit or karpos results from two life streams, the Lord living his life through ours to yield 
what is eternal. That's got a whole new meaning now, doesn't it? Now this offer that Jesus gives us to to have a life that produces much fruit, he's not talking about grapevines anymore. He's talking about a different kind of life. You know, it's that thing that every single one of us, and it's almost hard to put into words, but we all feel it. We all know it. It's in there. It's that I just have this desire to do something big. I just want, I want, I want to do something important. I want, I want to matter. I believe every single one of us, we were created to crave eternal purpose in our lives. And that's why sometimes you see people who make a billion dollars but seem really, really unhappy because Jesus says, you can do all you want in this world. If you're a branch that's disconnected from me, you can give that branch that's been separated from the vine, give it a billion dollars. It's not going to produce lasting fruit. Give it three houses and four cars and the best vacations in the world. It's not going to produce fruit if it's not connected to the vine. And he says, but if you'll connect your life to mine, I'm talking about a different kind of life. I'm talking about giving you a life with eternal purpose. I'm talking about you experiencing purpose in your life like you never thought you could and getting to leave the legacy after you're gone that you dream of leaving. Because we have that. We have this inner desire, something that says, like, I want what I do to outlive me. When I, when I, when I leave, I, I want people to to think I mattered. I want, I, want, I want the world to be different. I want lives to be changed because of what I did. And Jesus said, that's what I have to offer. I can give you that life if and only if you abide in me. And so then the question becomes, okay, how do we abide? And I'm going to tell you right now where I'm going. And uh, it almost sounds so elementary. Even when I was putting this together, I was like, <clears throat> I don't really want to talk about this, God. I want to talk about something deep. Because I've been in church for a minute, like some of you. And uh, God checked me on this. He said, I just dropped this thought in my head. He's like, Sean, what's deeper than talking about how to connect with the creator of the universe and then help people find eternal life through him? It's like, we're not playing games. Heaven's real. Hell's real. Let's talk about getting real practical and how to abide in Christ because it'll change the way we live and it'll change the influence we have in this world. And so I do want to get real simple and real practical. And here's what I started thinking this week is um, you just heard some, some stats from, from the guys and saw that video. And in the last three, four weeks, like 2,000 some people have put their faith in Jesus at a service. Like, that's not us. That's the power of God. But I do believe we have a responsibility to steward what God puts us in a place to have influence over. We're not called to produce salvations only. We're called to build disciples. That's who we're supposed to be. And so as a pastor, I got to make sure that we spend some time talking about how do we abide in Christ and let's make it real practical and give it handles so every single one of us feels comfortable enough to start doing it. Here's what I thought though this week. Here's what's funny. The people who are like brand new, like they're, you guys are gonna be like, mm, talk to me. We're gonna talk about prayer, the Bible, why the right people in your life makes a difference. Things that, that some of us who've been around for a while go, mm, got it. The truth is, as I start to say, let me make your prayer life simple. Here's what's going to happen. Some of us who have been doing this for like 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 plus years are going to go, well, I'm not supposed to need this kind of help, but talk to me, bro. Because <laughs> it's just good to be reminded. I believe this is going um, it's gonna, to it's gonna give some of our prayer lives and time in the word just like a shot of adrenaline. And for those, and for a whole bunch, it's going to give you a good start. So let's start talking about it. To abide in Christ, the first thing I'm going to do if I'm going to abide in Christ is I got to pray. I got to start talking to God. Now, probably none of you are in this church service or watching this, and you're shocked that the pastor said you ought to pray, or, or this is the first time you've heard it, right? But the truth is, sometimes the things that sound so simple are some of the things we do the least of. Not only that, sometimes the things that sound so simple, the things that we want to do more, we feel guilty that we do it, don't do it more, but when we try to do it, we feel so awkward and unproductive that sometimes, no matter how long we've been doing it, we start asking ourselves, why am I doing this again? Like, I'm busy today. You, you ever tried to pray and you felt like, like my words, like I think they hit the ceiling and came right back down? How long have I been praying about this thing? Like, what's the point? I'm so busy. Is it anyone listening and... I don't, 
I'm not that articulate. Like my wife called and prayed with me before this service. She quoted three verses in one prayer. Like I'm like, I can't even think of three verses right now, God. I, I, but she's quoted three verses and I literally went, yeah, what she said, God, amen. <laughs> you, ever, you ever go to pray and you're like, all right, I'm gonna pray. It's dope. And then you go. No. Do I fold my hands? Do I not? Do I kneel? I've seen the paintings. Do I close my eyes? And if I have one eye open, can I still talk to God or is that fake? Did I just turn into fake? Do I look up or down? It feels like heaven's up, but I see a lot of people look down. I'm so confused. It's true. And I, I've been doing this for a long time, and I can't tell you how many times I try to go talk to God, and I walk away going, I don't have a clue what I'm doing. I want to give you some handles today. You don't have to feel guilty about feeling a little awkward about prayer. I think Jesus would go, you're human. You're talking to an invisible God. It's okay. I got you. His own disciples who got to walk and talk with him and watch him pray, they couldn't figure it out. They felt awkward. They felt stupid. So they came to him one day and they said, Jesus, can you teach us how to pray? Here's what he said. This then is how you should pray. Now, before I read this, let me say this. I don't think Jesus is saying this is the only way to pray um, because he's talking about us communicating with the father. I'm a father. I have two teenage boys and a 21 year old. If they want to talk to me anytime about anything, I'm all ears. Like I want to know. In fact, if my son came in today and said, dad, I just want to talk to you. First thing I think is like, what do you want? And he goes, no, dad, I just, just want to talk to you. I probably start crying. I don't even know what I do. You can talk to God anytime you want about anything. But if you feel like, man, I want some structure, like Jesus, help me. He says, I got you. This then is how you should pray. Our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. I don't know about you, but even if I can quote that, which I know a bunch of you can, it's hard to take that into my time with God and remember all those elements. And sometimes I don't even understand what all of them meant. You know what I mean? And so years ago, we broke down what we all now call the Lord's Prayer into five things that we could figure out that Jesus was telling us to pray about. And then we created this really easy to remember acrostic and it's praise. Go ahead and put that up. Check this out. No, 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 the, the, the side third that says P-R-A-Y-S. It's coming. I can feel it. There we go. It's my fault. I jump around. They can't follow my notes. They're back there going, what the heck's he doing? Um, so, guys, I can't remember what I had for lunch yesterday. I remember this. Like, like, I never forget it. I used it this week. I hadn't used it for a long time. I used it this week. Take a screenshot. Take some notes today. Note takers get into heaven first. P-R-A-Y-S, praise, repent, ask your will, and show me. Five things that Jesus says that you can pray about. Praise, repent, ask your will, show me. Let's break it down. Go ahead and put that next one up. Praise, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Jesus said, what if you just started off with thanking God, telling him how good he is, thanking him for your life, thanking him for your job, thanking him for your family, thanking him that you have air in your lungs today, like... Just praise him and tell him how good he is and how worthy he is. For me, at this point of, of, the, of the prayer, I like to put on a song. And I'm a Christian, so it's going to be Red Rocks worship, obviously. And um, sometimes I'll sing the words of the song. Sometimes I'll just let the song play, and I'll just tell God what I'm thankful for. That's how I love to start my prayers. And then he said, repent, forgive us our debts, as we have also, we also forgive our, forgiven our debtors. He says, if you put your faith in me, your, your sins are forgiven, but it, it's kind of a really cool thing, a freeing thing to acknowledge to God when you're talking to him. I know I'm imperfect, and I know I'm a sinner, and I know I still need your salvation and your grace, and I'm so grateful for it. God, forgive me of my sins. Praise, repent, ask. God, give us today our daily bread. You're his son. You're his daughter. You've just spent some time telling him thank you. You've repented of your sins. You have every right in the world to say, Dad, here's what I want. Here's what I need. He loves that. He loves it when we ask. The next part is a, is a kicker, though. 
your will. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus said, you know what's great is to ask God for what you want. But you know what's life-changing is to follow it up with, but what I really want, God, is what you want for my life. And he didn't just tell us to pray this way, he showed us. You can go read this for yourself, but in the garden, right before he's arrested, before he's going to be crucified, he knows what he's about to step into. And he prays, the, 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 the fully man part of him prays with over, being overwhelmed by emotions. And he prays, God, if there's any way, take this cup from me. Take it from me. But not my will. Your will be done. That'll take your prayer life to a whole new level. God, this is what I want. But as the Spice Girls once said, what do you really, really want? <laughs> P-R-A-Y-S, show me and lead me not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. God, I got a lot of big decisions going on in my life. Would you guide me? Lead me the way you want me to go. Help me to go through the right doors of opportunity. Help me to walk away from the wrong ones. There's a lot of tempting things in this world, and I got big decisions every day. Show me where to go, what to do. Praise, repent, ask your will. Show me, and you are off and running. The Lord's Prayer, number one. Number two, the one thing I want to tell you about prayer is I like to remind myself it brings me peace. If we're not careful, our prayer life, and you'll know this if it's you, you could think back to like the last week's worth of prayers, and what if like they were all written out? Would it look like a conversation between two people having a relationship, or would it look like a Christmas list? You know what I mean? Is all I ever pray, God help me? God do for me? God give me? He's more than just a cosmic gift giver. He's more than just this vending machine that I just go to when I need something. I need to remind myself that when I pray, I'm actually establishing a real relationship with the creator of the universe, and that real relationship, the byproduct of that is peace. It's not that I always get what I want in the time frame I want. It's that I'm establishing a relationship with him, and that relationship brings me peace. Philippians 4, man, we need this. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, that's the asking, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I'm going to start with that P-R-A-Y-S when I want a little structure to my prayers. I'm going to remind myself I'm forming a relationship with him and peace is to be had because of it. And then I love this. I'm also going to remind myself that this, this can be all the time. I'm going to read a passage that some of you, you've heard before, you've said before. Um, you, any, any of you ever heard that, that passage, pray without ceasing? You ever heard that? I, the first time I heard that, I was kind of mad. I'll be honest. I was like, really? Like, I got a job, bro. Pray without ceasing. Rejoice always. This version says, pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. How am I supposed to pray continually? How am I supposed to pray without ceasing? And I had the most freeing conversation about prayer with one of my pastors uh, a while back. And, and I have two guys in my life that I call pastor. And I was talking with one of them about prayer. The, re the real reason I was asking him this question wasn't because I was curious about his prayer life. The real reason is, is because ever since I've become a Christian, I've always felt guilty about it. I probably just don't pray enough. And then when I do pray, I, I think I'm probably not praying right. Probably praying out the wrong things. Probably doing it wrong. Probably, like I'm always just, it's like, I, it's like I, I've always had this little backpack of like Christian guilt. And in that little backpack is I probably just don't pray enough. And so I'm asking my pastor, and I'm like, man, what's this look like for you? Because I have, like, friends who, if you're not praying, like, an hour every morning before your day starts, then, like, you're, not, you're barely saved. And, and I, I, sometimes I do that, and, but it's, it's really hard for me. Like, it's hard for me to focus for more than, like, four minutes on one thing. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't feel like, I feel like God's sick and tired of me after about 10 minutes, I'm going to be honest. I don't, I don't always do the hour thing. It, is there something wrong with me? Am I, am I not legit? Is... And he goes, man, he goes, my wife does that. He goes, but I don't either. And I was like, oh, really? <sighs> Thank you. He goes, I pray all day. I'm like, no, 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 why, whoa, what? You're not helping, you're making this worse. He's like, no, 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 just, just little short statements, like, all day. Like, I get in my car, and I'm just like, God, thank you that I got a car. 
I put on a worship song. Driving to work. I mean, God, thank you. Thank you for the chance to go do this. God, we're about to have a meeting. Help me in this meeting today. God, I'm on my way home. Help me turn on the energy again because it's time to be dad and husband. God, thank you for the kids. I don't say thank you for the food because that's just a ritualistic thing we do. I like to talk to God all day long. So thank you for this food. I wouldn't have it without you. He's like, you don't have to. He's like, you, you can. You can sit and pray for an hour or you can just make abiding with Christ a part of your everyday life all the time and stop feeling guilty for what you think you ought to be doing. Let me quote the brilliant Douglas Weckenman. It's like we were having this conversation this week, and here's what he said. It's like we abide on steroids for 15 minutes in the morning, and then we abide the rest of the day everywhere we go. You can sit down for 15 minutes and do that praise thing that I talked about. Put on one song, pray those five things, talk to Jesus, tell him thank you, have a great time. Or, and or, you can just talk to him all day long and stop feeling guilty for what somebody else does that you don't. And let this not be a guilt thing. Let this be an opportunity thing. Dad's not mad. He just loves to talk to you when you got the time. And he wants to communicate back. And the way he communicates back is the second part of this, to abide in Christ. We pray to talk to God, but then we get into the Bible so that he can talk back. That's why he calls it his word. And again, as I talk about this stuff, please put aside the temptation that so many of us have that are trying our best to follow God, which is, I just don't do it enough, or I just don't do it right, and God's probably mad. That Satan would love for you to think that dad's so angry and disappointed in you that what are you wasting your time for anyways? You might as well stay away. You got a loving father and he won't love you more if you talk to him 12 times this week. It'll just help you more. And he won't love you more if you read your Bible 12 times this week. It'll just give him an opportunity to change you more. But he loves you like crazy. And, and some of you, I, I know the deal. I remember the first time I opened up the Bible, um, I was actually smoking a cigarette while I did it, I'm just saying, and um, I didn't have a clue what I was doing. And I did the, the flipping point. You ever done that? I did the, oh, God, help me. I'm not sure. I got this girl issue, and what do you think? <laughs> Sacrifice? <laughs> Mind starts spinning. Close it up. Uh, if you're just starting out, I know a whole bunch of you are. I love to tell people, start in the book of John, and it's one of the stories of Jesus. Now, I like to say John because if you read the four Gospels in a row, which you can, they're all four stories of the life of Jesus. But I forgot to tell a friend once who gave his life to God to start in John, and he started in Matthew, and then he came over to my house like a week later, and I'm like, bro, how's it going? He goes, it's fine, everything's cool, but man, I started the second book, and it's like the same thing. And I was like, oh, that's my bad, bro. I like to tell people, start in John, you hear the life of Jesus, how to be saved, how the church got started, how to live. I mean, it's amazing. If you go, man, that that in and of itself sounds a little intimidating. That's okay. We got you. Go to our website. Click the next steps button. And under that is a just getting started page. And we have a 21 day devotional just to get you off and running. We'll give you a verse to read. We'll give you an idea to pray about. We just want to help you feel comfortable as you start spending time with God, because Jesus said, if you'll do that, if you'll abide in me, it'll change the way you live. The third thing is people. And I'm about out of time, so I got to I got to go quick. I I wanted to tell you all kinds of things about getting in the word, but it's not that hard. God, God created communication. He wants to talk to you through his word. If you give him a shot and just start reading it, he'll speak. Isaiah talks about he speaks in this little whisper. And what you'll find is is you'll be reading something and some little whisper, a little thing, a little check in your spirit will go, Ooh, that's for me. Ooh, I think that I need to pay attention to that. I should do that. Oh, I should share that with somebody I care about. There's just little thing, little whisper that God tends to do when we get in his word. And what I love to tell people to do is this, just read it, write it, do it. God, speak to me today. I'm going to read a couple chapters. I'm going to write down something you tell me, and then I'm going to pray you help me go do it. And let's not quit playing games, make this real easy, and let's go change the world and understand that God's leading us while we do it, okay? You can do this. And the last thing is people. Um, again, I'm, I'm, I'm out of time. I, I got to wrap up, but I can't tell you how much Getting the right people in your life will change your relationship with God and the whole thing. You want to get people that push you closer to God. Um, God's word says, and guys, I know I'm jumping around back there. Proverbs 13, become wise by walking with the wise, hang out with fools and watch your life fall to pieces. 
That word wise there, they're not, God's not talking about IQ points. Proverbs says the beginning of wisdom is the fear of God. So what it says is, if you wanna, if you wanna get close to God, start walking with people that wanna get close to God. And I'm telling you, the best thing you could do is find a local church that you can get excited about being that and plug in. Stop hopping around, church, 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 church. Find a church family, plug in, jump in the deep end, get in a group, get on a team, get in the services, become part of it, and watch what God will do. Prayer, Bible, people. And the truth is, I could have given you this message in 60 seconds, and we could have saved a lot of time. I just wanted to hang out. <laughs> I read Abide in Christ, and I instantly knew what I wanted to challenge all of us with. Guys, prayer and the Bible and putting the right people in our lives, that has changed my life in ways I never thought it could. And I know it'll do the same for you. Jesus isn't messing around. He's not playing games. He says, abide in me and I'll change your life. And then he shares with us the flip side of that coin, which is Luke 12. He talks about a rich young ruler, a, a branch who, that wasn't connected to the vine, but he was real successful. Jesus said, dude made so much money, he kept having to build more barns to store his resource. He just kept making money, making money, making money, building company, building company, building his own kingdom. And Jesus said he had so much potential and he built all this stuff, but he wasn't connected to me. And he got to the end of his life and he died. And all that potential was wasted and nothing was eternal that he was a part of and he missed it. Jesus is trying to help us see that that thing in your heart will not go away if all you do is keep building your kingdom. He says, you gotta get attached to me, be attached to the vine. Let that, the, the platform that you wanna live from is I just connect with Jesus and then everything I do comes out of that. Jesus said, when that's the way you live, it's a different life. It's an eternal purpose that you can't get anywhere else. And this guy in, in Luke 12, he had the kind of money he could have if they'd have had him in his day, he could, have, he could have had multiple Humvees, multiple helicopters bringing him a lot of chocolate chip cookies. And Jesus said, you still wasted your life, bro, because you weren't attached to me, and you just built your kingdom, and now you're dead and nobody cares. It's sad. And I saw the opposite of that this week. Um, if you were here for Easter, excuse me, if you were here for Easter, you know that I started out the Easter message by welcoming Fresh Life Church to join us. I did that because Levi and Jenny, the pastors of Fresh Life, had to suddenly leave town to go be with his dad, who had been battling cancer for a year because there was a turn for the worse. And a couple days later, Chip was his name, Chip Lusco passed away but Levi and Jenny and the kids got to be there with him at the very end, and so it worked out really well that we got to do church with Fresh Life on Easter so they could do that. And this Monday, I was at the funeral. And um, put up that picture of Chip. That's Chip, and that's Levi, and Levi's son, Lennox. And I was actually on that camping slash canoeing trip, and it was real stupid, and I got a whole bunch of good stories for you, but I'm gonna save those. But I got to hang out with, with Chip for a week on that trip, and amazing dude. I'm at the funeral on Monday. You can take it down. I'm at the funeral on Monday, and I couldn't, I couldn't like keep composed. I was so blown away. Guys, I've been to a lot of funerals. First off, Levi tells me that they got some seats saved in a certain spot. I'm like, yo, why does he got to save seats? He's like, bro, there's going to be over 2,000 people at the funeral. I'm like, what? We get there. It's the biggest funeral I've ever seen. And it's also being streamed online around the world. It's on radio stations in multiple states in the country because Chip had started over 100 radio stations just to tell people about Jesus. He was a, he was a messed up kid, got into drugs. He was, in, he was in Maui. And one day he decided, I think I need a change because my life feels like it's going down the tubes. And one day he came to a crossroads and he went, I'm gonna go to church today. And he was trying to decide, I think it was this. I think it was, there's a Buddhist temple and a Christian church. And he's like, I'll turn right. Went to the church. Nobody else showed up at the church. He was the only one there. And the pastor gave a sermon for one person, and Chip gave his life to God that day. Decided he's going to spend the rest of his life serving Jesus. Started churches, started radio stations. 
I'm telling you, every person who got up there to talk about him, all they could talk about was, he changed my life by, he changed my life when he gave, he, we're saved because of him. Uh, a lady from Red Rock said, I got baptized by him like 20 years ago in a church that he started. Like, um, our children are different, our lives are different. He served us, he gave us. He was always trying to help us find God and praying over us. And I was just sitting there going, who is this guy? This is unbelievable. And, and I was talking to Levi this week, just checking in, seeing how he's feeling. And I said, man, I gotta be honest, like your dad's funeral like moved me, man. Like, I don't think I've ever seen a funeral where so many people wanted to talk about how one person's just changed their life. And as I was talking to Levi, I found the secret. He said, oh, bro. He said, all growing up, every morning, my dad got up before all of us and he sat on the back porch. And in fact, when we were at his house, he showed me where he sat. And he said, he sat right here every single morning, just abiding in Christ. He said, that's all he did. He just got up every morning before everybody and went and prayed and read the Bible. And then everything he did came out of that. In fact, Levi sent me a picture. He goes, bro, here's just one page of his Bible. I mean, you want to talk about read it, write it, do it. He's like, he would, he would annoy us to death with, with family devotions. Every day, it was like, I gotta tell you what I got from God today. Let's do a family devotion outside. Let's do one in the kitchen. Let's do one in the car. Levi said he was a churchaholic, couldn't stay out of the house of God. Always just, I, and I, family members were talking about like, he was praying one day and then he prayed this over me and, and I was hurting and he told me God told him this today. And Levi said, when he found out he had cancer a year ago, the thing that made him the most mad was he was supposed to go to Africa and tell people about Jesus and the chemo was gonna get in the way of that. And then this past December, he was told that he had a year or less to live. And so he gets the family together and what's he do? He takes communion. He says, guys, this might be the last time we're all together. So what I want you to remember is Jesus and then he prayed blessings over all 20 of the grandkids and they played this video at the funeral and I asked Levi I said can I show our church this we play this it's just a few seconds uh, long security, but I have zero checks I know they're being each of these is being raised uh, in the Lord and they will um, they will not depart so I bless each one of you just God's blessing upon you with the power for peace the proper priorities in your life and that you would know how much Jesus loves you. That's why I ate Papa Chip Daisy, the pearls and wisdom. And you will be getting more of those. So, and over here. I bless you guys in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm watching this. And I'm, I'm just so moved. Like, I can't hardly keep myself composed. And I was sitting next to a really, like, cool pastor guy, so I was trying to be composed. And uh, it was interesting, the night before, we were flying from Omaha, where my son had a basketball tournament, to Albuquerque, where the funeral was. And we're sitting down at a restaurant in the airport, and my, and my wife goes, she goes, babe, what's on your bucket list these days? And I'm like, oh. I'm like, I know I should have a bucket list. I'm, I just... I don't, I don't know that I have one. Like, she's like, well, do you want to go anywhere? And I'm like, I just like going to places that you and the kids want to go to. What do you want to see anything? I'm like, I mean, I want to go to Israel, but that's because you want to go. And I'm like, I, don't, I know it's stupid. I said, babe, I'll work on it. I'll put together a bucket list. I kid you not. I saw that video and I'm sitting in the funeral. And I looked at Jill. I said, babe, I know my bucket list. I want to be remembered like this. That's my bucket list from now on. And Jesus wants that for me too. And he wants that for you. And he says, I can give you that kind of life. I can help you leave that kind of legacy. But it comes if and only if you're willing to abide in me because I am the vine and you are the branch. And if you'll stay in me and I in you, you'll bear eternal fruit that'll change your soul. It'll change your life in the here and now. And it'll change the legacy you leave when you're gone someday. He says, that's the life I have for you. Don't miss it. Abide in me. Would you stand up with me? Let's pray. God, I thank you. I thank you for your son, Jesus. 
I thank you that we can have an authentic, life-changing relationship with him and we've never earned it or deserved it. I thank you that we can have this with you. I pray, God, that for those who are new to this stuff, that this would not be um, overwhelming in any way, shape, or form, but that talking to you and letting you talk back to us through your word would just be this um, open, honest, easy process that we sort of just glide into even on the messy days and we just know it doesn't matter God's still with me God still loves me I'm still trying that's the whole goal I pray for those of us who deal with guilt in these areas that you would help us get rid of that like we leave that here today we don't take that home with us that stays here no more guilt I get to talk to you it's not a chore I get to get into your word it's not a chore Help us to find the joy and excitement in that. With everyone's eyes closed and no one looking around, I do wanna ask two questions and just give you a chance to respond to what Jesus might be doing in your life today. The first is this, you are a Christian. Maybe you just gave your life to God in the last few weeks. Maybe it was so many years ago, you don't even know how long it's been. But you go, hey God, this week, as I get into prayer in the Bible, would you reveal yourself to me in a whole new way? If that's you, just raise your hand. I'm just going to pray that you experience something different this week. Amen. Praise God. And, and the second question is this. I'm talking about this relationship with Jesus that can change your life. And you're sitting here going, wait a second. I need to start that relationship. I didn't know why I was coming, but now I do. I can just feel it. Like, this is my time. I need to ask him to forgive me of my sins so that I can put my faith in his son, Jesus, so that he can do life-changing things in me in the here and now, and so that I get heaven forever. And this is my moment today. I wanna make that decision. Today I say yes to Jesus. If that's you, raise your hand right now, and I'm just gonna say a prayer for you. I'll keep them up. Praise God, praise God. I see you, I see you, I see you. I see you in the front, I see you in the middle. Yeah, I see you right there. Praise God, praise God, I see you. God, thank you so much for what you're doing. Thank you for the eternal lives that are being changed right now. God, encourage us, equip us, give us excitement and joy as we start to walk into communicating with you this week. No more guilt, no more shame, just opportunity to enjoy your presence. And I thank you for the eternal lives that are being changed right now. God, let us sense your presence in a brand new way. And, and it is our absolute honor as a church family to worship you with music. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen, let's worship.